Cheers, everyone. Um, it's a cold, cruel world out there. I am totally out of beer. Nothing in my house to drink. But perhaps that's for the best. Uh, I've been away a bit. Um, in case you've been worrying that I haven't been accumulating more and more junk that I have no time to read. It's time. Whoa! <laughs> Don't worry, no children were hurt there. Um, time for a bit of a haul, trades mostly. Um, I will have other hauls coming up soon. I have. <clears throat> Excuse me, that didn't go the way I planned. <laughs> I've also bought a lot of uh, back issues in the past month or so. So, um, yeah, I'm just kind of getting back into doing videos. I was kind of been itching all along to do them. Um, I'm going to be doing a series of videos with uh, Matt, Agent 42Q, no, uh, Matt Wednesday Serial, maybe I'll put a link below to our first video where we talked about the first eight issues of Animal Man. I am really loving it in my deluxe size edition here. I have now read, what issue have I read up to? Anyway, uh, I've been reading, chugging along, so there'll be more more videos with me and Matt if I can uh, I'm sure he'll be fine with it. I'm up to issue 10 now so I think our next one will be like issues 10 through 16 or something along those lines but um, this is make, making me realize one of my New Year's resolution is to I should read I've been kind of accumulating these large size uh, additions and I it's time to hunker back down and read read more of them. Um, many of them are of classic things that I've read before sometime in the past, but it gives me new delight and pleasure to read them this way. So that's from a long ago haul, no doubt. Um, let me start here with, a, with an unbagging. I got something in the mail that is YouTube related. I don't know how many of you guys watch uh, P.T. Hilton, P.T. Hilton, I never quite, I got to listen more closely to how he pronounces his name, but he is a novelist who does a booktube thing and he talks about graphic novels as often as he talks about novels, but he has his own novels and novellas which are essentially self-published on Kindle, but I think he's, he's uh, definitely professional caliber. And I, I read a little bit of his stuff digitally, and then I saw that he was having this omnibus coming out, and it looked nice in the pictures, so I thought I would get it. Um, it's kind of a fantasy series, Zane Halloway, Assassin for Hire, Omnibus by P.T. Hilton. It's got, whoa, it's got a series of novellas about this character. One, two, three four, five, six, thorns and tangles, swords and shadows, lightning and thrones, flames and water, lies and crossroads, crowns and dead men. He likes the word and. Um, anyway, I'm really, I think I really want to read them physically. I like especially owning a book by someone that I know. I know him through YouTube, but, um, and he signed it to Damien slash Sleepy Reader 666. Welcome to the Ferox Society. Um, so uh, to me, the signature is nice since I have a, a bit of a connection to him through commenting on each other's videos and chatting a teeny bit on Twitter. Um, I, you know, as you guys know, I'm not reading a lot of prose, but I, I hope to get to at least some of this in the in the not too far future. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, it's kind of sword and sorcery fantasy, but um, 
I think it's about an assassin who uses magic from the little bit I read digitally. So that's really cool. So while I'm talking about non-comics, uh, something I picked up that I read on the airplane, and I still have a lot of it to read, is a new, new in quotes, well, it is new, Worcester and Jeeves novel, but it's not by P.G. Woodhouse. It's by this guy named Sebastian Fox. Apparently he's famous because they put his name much bigger than P.G. Woodhouse. I don't know if anyone else out there is a P.G. Woodhouse fan. I'm a huge P.G. Woodhouse fan, particularly of his Worcester and Jeeves novels. I like the PBS Worcester and Jeeves BBC show they did, but I feel like they can't compare to the original novels. Um, and this one does a pretty good job of imitating uh, the whole P.G. Woodhouse approach. I don't think the language is quite as rich and clever, but it's close. I don't think the plot is quite as tightly wound, but it's close. So um, I think it's worth getting. I, I got it on on a, some kind of bargain table. I think it came out in 2014 or 2013. 2013. So it must be out in paperback too. Anyway, um, if by chance anyone's a P.G. Woodhouse, this fan, this might be worth looking at. Um, so yeah, and uh, let's see. Well, one more non-comic book thing I got. I got one of the presents I got for Christmas is this microphone. So I will be trying that out soon. Um, I usually use this very simple Logitech microphone. I recently bought this Snowball, and it doesn't sound as good as this cheaper Logitech microphone. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it would sound better under different circumstances. And it also doesn't always register on my computer. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. It's kind of a pain in the neck. So I feel like this was kind of a waste of 50 bucks. Um, we'll see if this is any better. Part of this is, one, is it can attach to a laptop. And I'm planning on getting a new laptop, probably a Chromebook soon. Um, so I might be using that with this and get better sound. Maybe I can shoot videos, if this is any good shoot videos in uh, lots of different spots that I can take a small laptop with me, which I can't. Of course, I can take my iPhone with me anywhere. But anyway, that's kind of stuff that's bubbling around. Something else that I got in the mail just recently um, was, again, connecting our YouTube friends and comics, is uh, I got the first and second issue of like Father, Like Daughter uh, is issue one um, by Comic Book Uno and um, that she kickstarted. So I supported the Kickstarter on her second issue and the level that I paid at got me the first and second issue plus these two kind of jokey prints um, which are quite funny <laughs> uh, comparing... Um, invincible to her character. Um, so I thought that was very clever. She she realizes where her antecedents are and, and also brings in Batman and Robin. I haven't read issue two yet. I just got it in the mail yesterday. Um, the coloring looks a bit different than in the first issue. I My biggest complaint about the first issue was the coloring. I'm not sure that I'm going to be crazy about the coloring in this issue, but it, it may be an improvement. Um, but the most important thing will be the storytelling, of course. And I look forward. I was very eager after eating, reading issue one in PDF to see what she would do in issue two. So there's that. Okay, and I got some... Oh! One other... I don't even know what. It's in the pile, so... Um, for Christmas, I got Rush R40 Live. It's interesting in this modern world that we live in. Uh, you know, when I went to a concert as a kid, you saw the concert and that was it. It was over. But now, for a big group, there's going to be a DVD too. So this is a DVD, not of the very concert I saw, but of, a, of the same concert tour 
of a concert, the last big concert I went to, um, perhaps the last big stadium concert I'll go to in my life. I, uh, in general, I'm much happier going to see people in small theaters, and I'm the 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 price of tickets is so incredibly mind boggling. Back in back in other parts of my life, I I wasn't spending so much money on comics and trades and stuff. I was spending a lot more money on going to see live groups, but live groups were not this expensive back then. Um, but I used to go out and see music, and I mostly in clubs. Uh, you know, music two or three nights a week um, at times. And during the summer, just go to all kinds of outdoor musical events. Anyway, so this is kind of marks the end of an era for me in terms of, it had already faded out a long time ago. In terms of going to big coliseums, it is kind of fun that you can get a DVD of a concert you went to, professionally produced. Um, I kind of wish there were DVDs of concerts I saw as a teenager, but those are... They happened and they're gone. And on the other hand, maybe that's the best way for it. I have been thinking about nostalgia a lot lately, but I think I'm going to save that for another vlog. So, uh, more Christmas presents before I get to stuff I got myself from in stock trades. Uh, my two of my teenage, a, a, a nephew and a niece, uh, who we were visiting in the Philadelphia area at Christmas time gave me graphic novels. Um, I sort of suspect that my brother picked them out, or maybe his wife, um, but maybe they picked them out themselves. I'm not sure. They're kind of literary. Um, one is The Alchemist by Paul, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Cuello? I don't know. He's Brazilian. I don't know what the Portuguese pronunciation of C-O-E-L-H-O would be. But he's this really, really popular novelist around the world. And I've never read him. And I thought this was just the novel when they gave it to me. And inwardly, I was thinking, uh, I don't really want to read Paul Cleo. From what I've heard, he's kind of new agey. Um, but then the next day, I opened it up and I realized, oh, they gave me the graphic novel version. Well, now I'm more willing to try it. Maybe this will help me get into it. Or maybe... You know, it just seems more interesting to me as a graphic novel. I don't know if it'll make the world's greatest graphic novel or not. But, um, and maybe this guy's a great novelist, and I've just let, you know, some reviewers who didn't like him convince me otherwise, because I certainly have never tried him myself. So, um, you know, it, uh, art-wise, it looks okay. It looks professional. Um, so we'll see see how it reads eventually. But then the other thing they gave me was also a literary adaptation, but this has more of a pedigree that I'm interested in. Um, it's Paul Auster's City of Glass, adapted by David Mazzucchelli of um, uh, Batman Year One fame. And... Um, I don't know how many people know about Paul Auster. He's a very modernist or postmodernist kind of writer where reality is always kind of flexible and weird. It's kind of like a New York City version of Kafka in a certain way. And this one's like a bizarre Kafka-esque detective story. I've read about a little more than half. I've been highly enjoying it. I don't really recognize Mazzucchelli's artwork from his days in Batman, but I knew he had moved on into a more indie style, which is kind of an interesting thing for someone who was quite a famous comics pro to decide to go in this other direction. Um, it's kind of a f fun, surreal, bizarro story about, with a little bit about the nature of reality based on language and... Um, and what's the guy's main theory? Now it's slipped my mind. There's this weird guy that the hero's following around who has a theory about, about, um, dang, I can't remember. Something about America and language and that sort of thing. I guess I'm going to have to backtrack and read a few more pages when I dip back into this. I actually am kind of eager to get back to this. I was reading it on the airplane, 
I read some of this, and then I would switch off to the Worcester and Jeeves back and forth, depending on my exhaustion level on my plane, long plane ride. But since I got back to Portland, when I have any time, I've been trying to catch up on the huge number of floppies that I have built up from about four weeks of not reading my comics. I love... I'm torn two ways. I love the weekly picking up comics and reading them right away and getting the next chapter of the story and having it sort of roll out that way. But I also love, like I said, like with the Animal Man, reading a whole bunch together in some big deluxe edition. And, um, but I'm, it's, so it's a little bit of a treadmill getting the weekly ones. Um, that I, maybe I should think about in terms of, uh, I've been tagged to do a uh, New Year's resolu comic resolutions. I've got to figure out what my resolutions are. I've got these uh, <laughs> problems <laughs> uh, where I um, can't decide which way to go with all my reading and with my too much stuff to read. Way too much stuff to read. So onward and upward with too much stuff to read. Oh, here's something I don't have to read. This was part of a I did two in stock trade halls recently, um, right around Christmas time for myself, a uh, greedy bastard that I am. And one of the smaller things in there was this mini coffee table book, The Little Book of Wonder Woman from Tashin. And I don't know if it's like a shrunk down version of a pre existing full size book. I might like the full size book too. It's actually a really nice paperback with. You know, a paperback with actual binding. I like that a lot. Um, but if there were a large size paperback with actual binding. So, uh, yeah. So it's it's bound with the kind of the, the end papers that hold together the inner spine, uh, just like a hardback book. And that's very appealing. It's, it's by Paul Levitz. There's, you know, mostly there's uh, an introduction and then there's just little notes about different covers and images. And it's divided up um, into into different periods. And my my daughter was enjoying looking through it, but then there is a period that they call the Dark Age, and she has learned to be very worried about violence in comics. And um, she knows about the um, the. Uh, Comics Code Authority stamp of approval, but for her, that's a good thing. When she sees that, she knows she won't see violence that disturbs her um, because there's no blood in those, and uh, there's other, uh, very little other scary stuff. But really, sadly, because she skipped over this section, there's nothing in Wonder Woman's section of the Dark Age that's that dark. I mean, the George Perez... Wonder Woman, which she has read some of with me, is is part of that, what they define as the Dark Age. Um, so anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. I guess, you know, that's kind of a darker cover with with a Joker on it. Um, I, I am growing in my, you know, probably because of Cammy, but other factors, my daughter's inf interest, and just a number of people talking about Wonder Woman lately. I'm growing in fascination of how different people have dealt with her character and it's almost like this reflection of our society's anxiety over feminism and the role of women and how men should respond to it since most of Wonder Woman has been written by men. Um, I have more thoughts on that to come, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I was inspired after seeing Cammie's video that I'd, I want to hunt down some of that Golden Age Wonder Woman and read some of that. I, I, want, to, um, I want to look at different, more different periods of people doing Wonder Woman, and you'll see some of that when I do do a comic book haul later. Um, but this is a really fun book, and I think that there's some other ones, like maybe, probably Superman and Batman, of course. I'd love one on the Flash like this, because I love Flash covers. So this is just a fun thing, like a, a portable coffee table book. I don't know. I just really dig it. Then, um, okay, this is one that did not come from in-stock trades. I was going to order this from in-stock trades, 
uh, and it was like for sale for 60% off or 70% off, like just a few dollars. And I had seen it. Uh, it was highly recommended by um, Earl Gray in one of his uh, trade uh, trade videos. And um, it's got a bit of a Kirby Ditko feel to it and also a bit of the sort of the old idea of what alternative comics were, the, the indie alternative comics feel. Um, and so... Anyway, I I had it in an order at in stock trades and I you know, I was doing the math and I took it out and I thought I would order it later, put it on my wish list. And then it so was sold out and I couldn't get it from in stock trades at all. I was in a comic book store just looking around and there it was and I thought, "Oh, maybe I'll never get another chance to get it." So I bought it for full price, which is a bit steep for a slender volume like this. Where is the price? I think it was around Fifteen or sixteen dollars. Um, I'm at this point. I'm so used to buying everything on a discount. It was fifteen dollars that it felt very painful to buy this thin little thing for fifteen dollars. Um, but there you are. I have it. Sometimes you just got to get what you want when you can get it. Um, even in the age of internet, things uh, internet things sell out, become hard to find, and you know. But now on to more stuff that I got from in stock trades, and the uh, the discounts. I think you all know by now, but the discounts on in stock trades are crazy. And so, based on the fact that I was getting it really cheaply, I got the Dark Knight Three: The Master Race Number One in hardcover, and I really enjoyed reading it. Um, it's not. The world's greatest comic book and it's not you know it does not hold a candle to the original but it's a fun enough comic book and i realized when i was ordering it that i have and it does not have very good binding but otherwise it's a really it feels really nice in the hand i like i don't normally love jim lee but i like this penciled cover um I like getting what was the mini comic as a full size comic in the back. Um, but so I realized I have this fantasy going back to early childhood of comics being so important that individual issues come out as hardbacks, which is kind of what they do, I think, in Europe with their albums, although their albums are a bit longer than this and they don't, they only come out one or two a year, I believe. But anyway, this is a monthly comic book coming out in hardback, so I think I will continue to order them through in-stock trades, which means they're already two or three weeks later than the floppy, and then I get them even a week later than that, probably, or a week and a half later than that. But I kind of look forward to having all eight of them, and it looks like they'll make a picture when they're all put together. And I think the last one comes with a slipcase. And through in stock trades, it this costs about seven fifty, so um, it's kind of decadent because it's you know when I buy the when I have them all even all eight you know that's um, closing in on what about sixty bucks or or so um, so uh, yeah but that's fun for me. I'll, I'll save the last two big hardbacks for last. Uh, so, and then in another order, so I think I got a, a giant omnibus, the Dark Knight one and the Wonder Woman one together. And then in another order, I got another giant omnibus plus these two um, paperback trades. Drifter Volume 2, The Wake. And I have Drifter Volume 1. I haven't read it yet, but I just decided I, I might as well get the whole thing. Um, I, is it my imagination or is the art style changed? Do they, is it still the same art? It still says Nick Klein, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just my imagination that the art style is, looks different, unless there's a different colorist. And then I heard people talking about Wolf Moon, and it sounded like a cool idea. I like werewolves. I'm not sure everyone totally loved it by the end, but anyway, as a trade... Um, from in stock trades, it seemed seemed worth getting. The art looks really cool, if a bit dark. 
Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to reading both of those, particularly Wolf Moon. So <clears throat> one of one of these is something I've been lusting after since it first came out, and uh, involves you know the original comic books I've been lusting after all my life, and then I got a couple of paperback trades that cover most of, of these issues. Um, but they're much smaller and in bad shape at this point. And I probably own a few of the issues, too, of the original issues. But the thing is, I was feeling cheap. And so this one edition with a much less exciting cover than the other edition uh, was on sale for like 70% off. 60 or 70 percent off anyway i got the whole shield omnibus and it was uh 38 dollars um and it's got this basically cover that is an advertisement for the tv show uh marvel's agents of shields I mean, it even says watch the tv series abc right on the cover um so I think I'll just be storing the dust jacket somewhere. On the inside, unfortunately, there's no... I mean, it, it's, at least they've got that. Um, but it is the really nice lay-flat binding that I expect from Marvel. It does have the big fold-out pages. Um, I'm kind of in an awkward position now to do it. I am as excited to read the complete... Uh, Jack Kirby work on S.H.I.E.L.D. as I am to read the complete Storenko work. Because I think, as I said, in, in the paperback version, I have the all the Storenko issues, but I don't think I've ever read all the Jack Kirby issues. And then I really never even knew what came after Storenko. I seem to remember a Frank Springer issue. But... Um, But it, oh, it's one of the fold-outs. It's so heavy, I'm afraid when I hold it up, I'll rip it. But you get the sense of how gigantic these fold-outs are. Carefully fold it back. Um, but so after Storenko leaves, there's a number of artists, but one artist that I noticed in here particularly interests me is Herb Trimp. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the Herb Trimp issues, which I had not even known about. Um, I am a Herb Trimp fan, and my my fanish my fanish feelings towards him, Herb Trimp seem to have grown in recent years. I'm not sure what that's all about. <clears throat> Dang it! Another interesting thing I was like I was looking at the credits of the Jack Kirby issues and we all know that the way Stan Lee and Jack Kirby worked is Kirby pretty much did all the plotting uh, maybe you know with a very brief discussion with um, Stan Lee but and then after Kirby is not drawing it he's still doing the layouts which actually means he's still doing the plot so like this issue is claims to be written by Stan Lee laid out by Jack Kirby, and drawn by John Severin. So that is basically um, Kirby laid it out while coming up with the plot. John Severin tightened it up in pencils. Stan Lee added the dialogue and slightly changed Kirby's plot by however he used the dialogue, and then Severin did the inking also. Um, at least that's, I presume, how the process worked. It might be that Lee put in the dialogue before Severin came in at all. And then some is, yeah, so all of these list Kirby, all of these that aren't fully penciled by Kirby still list Kirby as the layouts. Um, but he doesn't get credit as a scripter or a plotter. But just historically, we know that's what he was really doing. Um, so yeah, different people, on each issue, it seems different people are working over Kirby's layouts, like... Um, Severin and then Don Heck and then other people some issues are fully penciled by Kirby and then if I can find it 
basically there's three issues that are um and that's a, not a curve. Three issues that are laid out by Kirby and then finished by Starenko, which means that um, the early Starenko were Kirby, were basically Kirby issues, with, with Starenko being like the apprentice, so to speak. There's Don Heck again. There's a lot of Kirby based issues. So I'm trying to find the. There's uh, layouts by Jack Kirby, pencils by John Buscema. I think that's one of John Buscema's very first works at Marvel. Am I right? I don't know. I know he had to... Uh, here's an issue. So this says script by Stan Lee, layouts by Jolly Jack Kirby, artwork by Jaunty Jim Starenko. So Kirby came up with the plot, laid it out, and then Starenko got to come in and put his style and his figure work over the basic layout of Kirby. And I assume by layout that means all the figures are where Kirby put them, the sort of the storytelling, um, but he didn't uh, put in any detail. And the, the penciler slash inker like Starenko can come in and move things around slightly. Um, and then the, the story's already been made up by Kirby. And so bear with me, I'm, I'm going on kind of long here. So then there's, there's another pure Kirby issue. And then there is, uh, after a number of issues, there is the first issue without Kirby, which is scripted by Roy Thomas, but plotted and drawn by Jim Starenko. So Jim Starenko, pretty much as soon as he was no longer, as soon as Jack Kirby was no longer plotting this, he got plotting credit. But Jack Kirby never got plotting credit on any Marvel comic, other than maybe uh, when, he, when he was officially the writer on the Inhumans. So what this leads me to conclude particularly having heard Starenko tell all these heard Starenko tell all these stories about how wonderful he is <laughs> um, is that Kirby did not have a strong enough personality to force getting the credit and Starenko comes right in and says wait a minute I'm plotting this story you have to give me plotting credit in the credits um, so he plots a, f I don't know. So after Kirby's gone completely, after he's done sort of working over Kirby, he um, plots one story with Roy Thomas doing the script. And then by the next issue after that, this is the first issue where he is both, he's fully the writer and the artist. Um, so if Jack Kirby had been as aggressive as Starenko, could he have stayed at Marvel and gotten full credit uh, and, and then been much happier? I mean, he left for DC to get his credit and his control over stories that Starenko was able to get at Marvel. Did seeing Starenko jump ahead like that so easily frustrate Kirby even more? Is that part of what drove him to... I have to look at the timeline of when these S.H.I.E.L.D. came out. Because supposedly in his last two or three years at Marvel, Kirby was planning to leave. And you could see that he wasn't putting as much into his work as he was before. Uh, especially into the plotting and the creating of new characters. Um, another thing that that made me think about is I've watched on YouTube various panels of Starenko telling his story of how he ended up at Marvel. And basically... You know, in that he kind of waltzes in. Stanley sees his um, sees his portfolio and says, "You can choose any one of these comics here on our rack of all the comics we publish, and we'll give it to you." But what we see here is they didn't give it to him just like that. Um, he had to work over Kirby's plots and layouts for three issues, and then he had to work for another issue with. Um, with Roy Thomas as scripter. Now it's still very fast moving that um, propelled him to uh, having complete control himself over the, um, 
over the comic strip. And I think he eventually left Marvel in part because he didn't want Stan Lee editing him at all and changing anything in his work. Uh, The sad part of that is he didn't really continue to do comics except for one or two things. So anyway, be that as it may, you know, sort of looking at the evidence uh, with, you know, little bits of information here and there makes me think Starenko exaggerates how wowed Stan Lee was by him. I'm sure he was wowed by him, but, uh, um, but it didn't happen, you know, the in the way that Starenko tells that story. And that when push comes to shove, Stan Lee was willing to give people more credit. They had to ask for it, maybe. They had to be pushy, or maybe there was something charismatic about Starenko that made it harder for Stan Lee to do that but it might have been that Jack Kirby did not ask as directly and as forcefully as Taranko did he may have just been kind of muttering off in the distance that you know how come Stan Lee gets all the credit on my stories anyway that's a thought part of my obsession over the silver age the era before I started reading comics finally I haven't I still haven't even unwrapped it is the third hardback of um, The Sixth Gun. I have all three of these enormous um, Sixth Gun omnibuses or deluxe editions and I haven't finished reading volume two and so I feel like I kind of got to go back and read volume two from the beginning then read volume three. Um, I think I I think I read the first three paperback trades before I I gave those away, or maybe it was the first two, and then I um, switched to waiting for these deluxe editions. They are beautiful, but not with good binding. Not with binding that um, protects us against gutter loss. I'm trying to open it now. I still feel they're worth it, but I, I do. I am a bit surprised that Oni creating such a big deluxe edition on this incredible paper and with all these extras and stuff didn't go the extra mile to get the good binding. I mean, really, these Marvel omnibuses, and Marvel is so cheap on other products they produce, but these Marvel omnibuses have binding to die for. I mean, everybody should be doing it this way. So here it is. I'm cracking it open for the first time. Very, the binding is very stiff. I don't know. Is there? Will there be a little gap there? I think there's some kind of hybrid of glued and sewn that they're using here, but I'm not sure. I'm not an expert. I love the the matte paper that they use. It's very thick matte paper. Um, It gives the the colors a whole different quality that you don't see so much. And you know, I. Maybe this is their rationalization. Most of most of um, Six Gun does not use two-page spreads, so there's always plenty of gutter space there. But I know at times there are two-page spreads. At least I found them in other volumes. I'm not seeing any right at this moment. <laughs> uh, this is gorgeous. Can't wait to read it. Well, I am going to wait to read it. I have so much other stuff, actually, that I have slated to read before this. I definitely need two or three staycations to really catch up on all of my beautiful, beautiful trades. So, yeah, and the cover feels so nice. I I recommend these, and I recommend Six Gun. It's very unique. It stands alone as a magical fantasy horror western. So uh, I thought this would be a short little video. It's not so short. I probably will never be short-winded. Wow, almost 40 minutes. <laughs> I had no idea how much time I'd been talking. Okay, um, if you've made it to the end, write yabba dabba do in the comments.